When most people think of conservation careers, they think of a scientist, usually in Africa, like Jane Goodall, studying a charismatic species like a chimpanzee or an elephant. But as you'll find out from this episode, there is so much more to conservation careers. I found this out later in my um, life after my PhD, but you don't have to. You can watch this episode and learn from Dr. Nick Askew. I interview him. He is the founder of Conservation Careers. We talk all about his path to becoming an entrepreneur and starting conservation careers, and also some of the ways that he was able to pivot. He's worked with nonprofits. He um, was working with a consulting company and he has a research degree. So he has a lot of great perspective on different fields. And of course, he runs conservation careers. So he's giving advice to students about careers that work for them. This field is so much broader than you ever expected. We're gonna give you some tips. And let me tell you, if you're applying for hundreds and hundreds of jobs and getting no responses, you're not doing something right. So listen to this episode to figure out how you can improve. Well, hi, Nick. Welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to talk with you today. Hi, Stephanie. Yeah, great to be on the podcast too. Thanks for inviting me. Good to chat. How are you doing? I am doing well today. So you are the founder of Conservation Careers, and you founded this how many years ago? It's a pretty oh. established company now. Yeah, right. We've been around for, I think it's seven years now. Yeah, just over yeah. seven years. Um, in the early days, it was very much again a side hustle for the first two or three years. And then I've been full time for four now. So yeah. If you can call that established, I don't know, but it feels like a long time for me. <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely established. And you are a, a major website for people interested, obviously, in conservation careers. You have job listings, you have programs. What made you, so your background is you have a PhD. What made you want to transition from a, a more academic science background to helping others find their career path? Yeah, yeah. Big question. Uh, good question. Um, so uh, I, I'll try and keep it as brief as I can, I guess. So my background, as you say, is in science and research. So I did a PhD studying barn owl conservation and behavioral ecology, trying to understand why barn owls here in the UK had declined quite rapidly over the last sort of 30, 40, 50 years and what we can do to help them. So that was like a three, four year PhD at York Uni um, in the north of England. I sort of, I left that and decided at that point to kind of leave academia behind actually. I enjoyed it, I loved it to bits. You know, I really loved the, the research and the study and everything that came with it. But I also realized I think that academia wasn't for me in the long term. When I looked around and my friends who had got PhDs and were going into postdocs, I saw their career trajectories being different to mine. Yeah, I just didn't want to kind of stick in the academic route and I think producing papers and doing research all the time wasn't going to be suited to me. I wanted to do other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of switched gears, I guess. I, I moved because my now wife was living in the south of England. So I just kind of moved to be close to her, started job hunting uh, and got a job fairly quickly as an as a ecological consultant. So I was working, doing impact assessments for um, different developers and giving advice upon what they could and couldn't do within environmental law. Two years down the road from that, that wasn't quite for me either. I felt like I was really working for the man. It was working for like a big mm. consulting organization, a multinational. And I was a very small cog in a very big wheel. And yeah, as much as I enjoyed um, going out into the field, I really enjoyed the field aspect of that. I enjoyed the training aspect of that. They gave me great training, project management, budgets, people, staff, whatever. That was all there at the beginning, which was really nice grounding coming out of academia into more of a real world environment, I might say. Um, but again, it wasn't quite right for me. So I jumped ship again. I then worked for 10 years um, for BirdLife International, which is a conservation uh, charity, We're a network of conservation NGOs. So based in... 120 partners around the globe so in the us it's audubon was the the bird life partner mm -hmm. in the us and the uk over here it's rspb and there's 118 other conservation organizations all focused around nature conservation and, and bird conservation so i worked for them for 10 years um, and had a really happy 10 years doing communications 
doing um, fundraising from the Pacific um, and doing marketing activities too. Um, and towards the end of that, and as I was moving back from the Pacific, I was based in Fiji for two, three years, fundraising out there for our Pacific partners. As I was moving back to the UK, I, I decided it was time for me to kind of just do my own thing, really. You know, I've always wanted to start my own enterprise. Um, hmm. I, I, um, I've always had a slight sort of entrepreneurial streak, like as a kid, you know, I had loads of different jobs and I enjoyed that sort of, <laughs> that, sort of that aspect of things. And I also felt like, you know, that, that, um, during my career as a conservationist, lots of people have asked me, you know, how do I get a conservation job? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's a whole army of people out there who would love that, that, that question to be answered fully and completely. And, and they deserve really good career support. They, they deserve really good uh, guidance, you know, and, and, and um, there really wasn't anyone helping them, you know, sort of seven, eight years ago. Um, and I also, on the other side of it, as I was backfilling and recruiting for my job out in the Pacific, I was struggling to find quality people to kind of come in and, 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 um, and do the work. It wasn't that they didn't exist. The, the, the world is full of amazing people that are way better than me. Um, but the website wasn't really there to connect with an international audience of conservationists who wanted to travel and they wanted to kind of move between different countries. So I kind of put those two bits together. You know, I thought mm -hmm. well, if we can start an international website that shows all the jobs and the full breadth of jobs from around the world, that would be great. That would help a lot of people and showcases a lot more out there than people realize. And the other bit is more than just jobs. You know, let's provide really good, effective, honest, um, evidence-based careers, advice and support that gets people hired quicker. And that was, the, that was the basis of conservation careers. And rather than starting a charity, um, you know, and perhaps relying upon donations, let's do this as an enterprise, an eco enterprise or a social enterprise, something that balances profit and purpose. You know, the, the bigger we get, the, the, the better we are, the more people we can help, the more impact we can have. So that's probably a very long answer to a very short question. No, that's, a, that's okay. You can take as much time as you want. That's a okay. great answer because I, I love hearing people's paths because I think just so many people think it's so straightforward. I actually didn't know you had so much experience working for these different companies and nonprofits. So it's just really interesting to see that if people are unhappy where they are, that they have options. And I think it's so cool that you created your own company because I don't really see scientists doing that, at least in the more ecology wildlife field, maybe in industry and biotech and things like that. That's not uncommon, but in our field, it's, it's really rare. And you're oh. so right. The advice out there. I remember when I was job searching, um, when, when I first entered, like I couldn't even find advice on how to write a resume for a career like mine. It would all be like business resumes. <laughs> and I was like, how do I add, like, I help ban birds or something, you know? Yeah, I know. And we, you know, and we get a lot of people coming to us now who are, we call them like career switchers. So they're doing something from mm -hmm. outside of wildlife conservation. They want to switch their career in whatever it is they're doing. And, and I think they, they need the kind of insider's perspective and support from someone who understands the industry, mm -hmm. understands even what a wildlife resume CV looks like, how to apply for these sorts of jobs, all that kind of, you know, this kind of feeling of imposter syndrome coming from outside in is really strong and something to be kind of broken through. Because I think the industry nowadays is looking for really good quality people to come in and kind of shake things up. You know, we just, we did recently like a course around communicating conservation 41% of employers are looking for people with really good communication skills. And a lot of those are found outside of conservation. They're the people working in marketing, media, PR. They could, you know, if we can bring those into the industry, they could really shake things up. They can really drive a lot more impact, you know, generate a lot more support, you know, make bigger campaigns, so on and so forth. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot, a lot kind of linked to that. Yeah. And actually just touching on something else you said as well, like around, Kind of starting a business in this area yeah I, i'd love to see more many more businesses kind of you know trying to start that make a real impact for the planet as well and mm -hmm. i think there's a huge niche and a huge opportunity to do that um charities do amazing work you know we should all find a charity we love and that we want to support and get behind it you know i understand i worked for one for 10 years you know i think it's great but I also think that the model of a charity is limited as well. It has the limits of how much yes. you can raise in terms of donations. And that's, that's its kind of glass ceiling. You know, a, a charity can only really go so far. It can only get so much money in terms of just what people are, are willing to give it. You know, so that kind of limits the impact at a certain level, whereas a business is kind of different. You know, if you can create a business that can scale, 
you know, that generates mm -hmm. revenue, which you can reinvest and then grow. There's, there's no reason why that couldn't really grow, you know, to a much bigger entity, potentially. I'm not saying conservation cruise is ever going to get enormous. I don't really want it to either. But I think <laughs> that the business models could do that, that charity models yeah. can't. So this kind of eco enterprise idea, I think really is a, a new growth area for impact on the planet. Yeah, I was talking to Laura Marsh about this too. And in our field, I feel like there's this like bias or negative view of like when you say you're going to be a business. And because I think people immediately, well, especially in our field with conservation, people I think immediately think of like these big corporations destroying the environment. But um, someone like yourself or me, you know, we're doing everything digitally and we're creating stuff that helps people. And I agree that it, I don't want to start another nonprofit because it would also take away from other nonprofits out there that are doing great work. So I want to encourage everyone out there, if you have a cool idea that can help benefit conservation, the environment, and you're business minded to, to go for it. Go for it. Absolutely. Yeah. So Laura at Nova, you know, it'd be great to see where she goes and yeah. how big it's going to get. Yeah. In fact, I was meant to be talking to her in in about an hour's time, but we've, we've oh, just really? for next week. So it's a very small world. That's another lesson, I think, for us. Yeah. It's a really oh my gosh, small it is world. so small. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you before we jump more into conservation careers, um, did you find it? So, so when you had your PhD and then you switched to consulting, to me, that seems like kind of an easy pivot because you probably used a lot of the same, um, mm -hmm. like, data collection skills that you use, but what about moving to nonprofit? And um, cause you said you did a lot of fundraising and marketing. So yeah. it sounds like you weren't really doing research. You were, you were more on the fundraising side. How, yeah. how was that transition? Yeah, I think that's a fair summary. I think going from PhD research into consultancy, there's a lot of overlap there. It was, it was out in the field, um, identifying species and habitats, which was something I was already doing and quite happy and comfortable with. Um, and then writing reports, analyzing results, presenting results. That's basically what a PhD is. So it's similar to that, but just within a kind of slightly smaller box. Um, when I moved to BirdLife and the charity world, what I was doing initially was communications officer, communications manager work. So I was managing the website. I was writing press stories, news stories, um, and all the stuff that kind of comes with that, you know, newsletters, all that sort of stuff. I had no background or training whatsoever in that. So I was very much kind of learning as I went, had a real passion for it. It was bird conservation and I loved that and I knew it fairly well. Um, and I liked writing, I'd entered a few competitions as a student and done okay at them. So there was some evidence there that I could do it, but I think they sort of took a punt and, and I sort of just learned on the job, you know, I was surrounded by really mm -hmm. good people who taught me um and together we were, we were a really good team um from there the extension then from being a communication communications professional into being a fundraiser is actually quite a small step really because mm -hmm. fundraising is really about um well it's about developing projects that work so understanding the problems and the solutions but then it's all about how you articulate that to a donor and you're just communicating right. to a donor it's just a specific audience rather than general public or scientist, whoever it was, that the, the audience was the donor and donors tell you what they want. These are the criteria. We support these sorts of projects. You know, this is what we're looking for. It's my job to find projects and shape and mold them um, from a communications perspective to fit what that donor is looking for. And really, I think fundraising at its bottom line really is a kind of communications role. I'll give you an example of that. So mm -hmm. um, in Fiji, there's a bird there called the Fiji petrel, um, which is a seabird. It's critically endangered. It only breeds on one island um, on Fiji now, which is a very small island. And it breeds in the uplands there. And we, we still haven't found any burrows of them, but we know that's where they breed. That's the only place they kind of come to land and are seen, you know, kind of crashing to buildings late at night, that sort of stuff. Um, and because it's critically endangered, it, it needs work. We need to find the burrows. We need to protect it from invasive species that come and eat the eggs and the chicks in the nests. Um, it's found in cloud forest. Um, it's, um, it's a community-based conservation project because there's local community members that are involved in kind of finding and protecting the nest. It's a seabird that goes out to sea, so it's overfishing. There's all sorts of ways of kind of looking at this particular project. So when we're looking for donors for that project, like almost almost any donor, we could kind of then reshape and remold this, pro this, this project into, and it worked really well. So climate change is a cloud for us. Community-based conservation, we're working with community-based members. Anything to do with the sea, it's a seabird that goes out and fishes, it's impacted directly by that sea, you know, and so on. I mean, almost every aspect is, mm invasive species and so on so it's very much looking at it from the comms perspective it's just you know it, i think everything became a step you know and 
Um, so yeah, academia, academia became consultancy fairly easily. Consultancy to comms was probably a bit of a leap, but I knew the theme, I knew the subject. And then from there into fundraising and then finally into marketing at BirdLife, which is just bringing communications and fundraising together, really. It's just like, mm -hmm. it's, it's basically like a sales process. So yeah, and I think that's a big part of it for me. I, I, when I look back at my career to date, and I'd be interested to hear like if, how you feel as well. Like I, I feel like my career has kind of gone in sort of three year cycles almost. Three years feels like, you know, I sort of did, I did comms for sort of three years. I did fundraising for sort of three years. I did mm -hmm. marketing for three years. I did, my PhD was three or four years. I think what tends to happen with me is I get really interested and excited about a new thing. Um, and year one is all about just throwing myself at it and, and really enjoying the learning. Um, and everything's new, everything's exciting. And I didn't know this before. And oh, that's great, you know. And year two often is kind of, yeah, I'm getting okay at this. I'm, you know, fairly good at this now. I know what I'm doing. I've learned it and I'm enjoying that process, being good at something. And then year three comes along. It's like, you know what? I've done it for two years now. I'm starting to get a bit bored. And, you know, that, that challenge is gone. And yeah. I need the next thing. And so I think for me in my career, and I don't know if other people feel that too, it's, it's about keeping that challenge fresh and keeping that learning and that stretch going. Yeah, I guess for us here in the US, ours are much longer. So our PhD was ours is much longer than than yours in Europe. Ours goes for at least five years, but a lot of ecologists uh, take like closer to seven. That's what I took, six and a half years. Yeah. And then I did have a long postdoc after that. So I guess maybe I'm more in six to seven year cycles than, than yeah, three year right. Cycles. Just just because the projects are longer, right? Yeah. <laughs> but one question. Um, I wanted to ask you is, so when I graduated uh, with my PhD and then I had been doing my postdoc for a while, during my PhD program, there were kind of like side opportunities, like, like the National Science Foundation would put on a program and stuff about science communication and like saying that you could pivot as a scientist in, the, in this field, like kind of like how you did with a nonprofit. Um, but when I applied for those jobs, I found it really hard to be competitive for them, honestly. And I found mm -hmm. that they really wanted people who had communications degrees um, and not necessarily were scientists, more communications professionals, but maybe they love nature conservation rather than a scientist who's interested in, in conservation. Would you say that that's true, that it's shifted more towards that, that that organizations are, are, are hiring more non-scientists? Now, yes. Yeah. yeah. I think in the last five, 10 years, for sure. Yeah. So when I was signed up as a comms um, professional, it was 15 years ago. And I was working yeah. for a very much a kind of scientific based organization who tended to employ scientists. I think that kind of fitted the culture. It's changed now, but I, I kind of fitted that mold. I was a scientist by background. I had a, I'd done a bird conservation PhD. I had an interest in comms. You know, there was a lot of stars aligning from both sides that that enabled me to go into that team. And I was surrounded by other people in my small comms team who had a very similar background to me. One had a PhD in bird conservation, and the other also had a had a really good degree and had a long a long track history of doing kind of bird conservation stuff. And he'd moved within that organisation too. But nowadays, I think that's very different. So BirdLife International, kind of staying with that employer, you know, scroll forwards, you know, 10, 15 years is actually employing comms professionals from outside of conservation. Yeah. They're looking for people from from industry who have a strong background and have been doing this professionally. Yeah, mm -hmm. but, but I think that's, and that's probably typical of the larger NGOs um, more. I think the smaller NGOs, the smaller charities, I mean, conservation sector is dominated by charities. Um, there's lots of other employers do charity, conservation work too, but charities are the big ones. The smaller charities don't tend to have, depends on how small they are, don't tend to have like big comms teams. There might be an individual does comms work, or it might be that everyone across the organization, organization does a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. And it's sort of spread across. And in that instance, then they're probably not employing these comms professionals, you know, from corporate and business. Um, they're just looking for people with a whole, you know, selection of different skills that they can kind of, you know, do the jobs that are needed within that. Jacks of all trades is what they want. Right. Yeah. And I just bring that up because, like I said, during our graduate program, they made it seem like it was such an easy pivot. And what I tell people is to like mm. really look at the jobs that you want now 
and what they require. Because like I applied for, or I was interviewing for a job. And one of the reasons why I didn't get it is because I didn't have any fundraising skills. And if I knew that in graduate school, that like, that's so important for nonprofits. And I know that sounds like a no brainer now, but I just imagined, you know, like the research being very different than that department. And it's not necessarily so. And um, I'm, yeah, I'm just saying that because I wish like somebody had told me that and, and to do your research now ahead of time. But yeah, yeah, this, so this leads into my next question. Um, but like, what is a conservation career? Because I think a lot of people think it is like how Jane Goodall was out in the field watching chimpanzees. But what is a conservation career today? Conservation career, we, we define a conservation career or a conservation job as any job where the results of your work, you're helping to conserve wildlife, either directly or indirectly. So yeah, there's the Jane Goodalls of the world that are active out in the field, conserving, you know, gorillas in the mist and others. And um, there's people, you know, working on beaches, conserving turtles and people out, you know, studying lions and tigers and all the other charismatic species that we all care about and love. Um, but beyond the kind of science and research and the kind of field-based skills, there is a, there is a huge selection of jobs and career options within the conservation industry. So we've listed 30,000 conservation jobs in the last four or five years through the site. And of those, we've listed over 14,000 different job titles. Okay, wow. so, you know, there's just such a huge breadth of different stuff within there. So let's stick with the Fiji example we we're talking about before. So the, 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 maybe the conservation officer from Nature Fiji who goes out to the villages, works with the community members uh, and goes off and surveys for the Fiji petrol. They're doing a conservation job. They're community-based conservation and probably science and research as well, something like that. But then back in the office, there were, there were people like me who were the program managers and the fundraisers who didn't really get out in the field much. But we were very much, you know, designing, developing the projects, finding the funds and then passing it over to the project managers around the site doing that work. You know, just because we weren't in the field doesn't mean we weren't doing conservation work. We were. Right. You've still got the communicators. You've got the, the IT, the GIS, the geographic information mapping experts and so on. You know, I, uh, what we've done at Conservation Careers is kind of broken the, the sector down into kind of 15 main job types. Mm -hmm. um, to kind of showcase the, the breadth and diversity, but also to help people to organize and try and understand where they might fit within that and understand there's still a lot of diversity within each of these areas. And I probably can't reel off 15 off the top of my head, but I can give you an idea of the <laughs> sorts of types we're talking about. So we talked about science and research and fundraising, project and program management. We talk about ecotourism, you know, and travel mm -hmm. and, and how that really helps wildlife if done right in, in ethical ways. Um, we talk about, you know, filmmaking and photography, you know, and, and how that can help the world. You know, um, marine conservation is a huge area that's really popular with people. Um, animal welfare, you know, um, sanctuaries, zoos, rehab centers, you know, again, if done well, really benefits mm -hmm, conservation yeah. and so on. It's, it's, it's vast, it's broad, you know, and I think understanding that, that huge picture is, is important because it's, it's, it's bigger than most people think. Um, and there is, um, well, I, I often say to people, there's, there's kind of good news and bad news with kind of conservation careers and conservation jobs is there are more jobs available than I think um, than ever before, than people realize, yeah. even with COVID, you know, we've still got a lot of jobs, you know, in the world right That's now. Great. And yeah, and employers are looking for staff all the time and things have rebounded the last year since all the craziness. Um, so that's the good news. The bad news is often there's more people looking for those jobs too. So it's maintaining, if not increasingly competitive, you know, so, so your, yeah. your job, if you're looking for a job, which very much, you know, aligns with what you're saying too, Stephanie, is like, it's, it's sort of finding your niche and then understanding what mm. employees are looking for within that specific niche. So if you'd known about that, about communications or known about that, about fundraising, then you could have broken down and said, right, this is the requirements. This is what I've got. This is what I still need to get. And I can figure out how, how I'm going to get those things. But kind of finding that sweet spot is really, is really important. Yeah. And I'm happy to dive into more detail into that sort of stuff if that's. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think one of the reasons why it's so competitive is because I get the sense that people are all going towards this one type of job, L like the, the research jobs, or the, I see a lot in wildlife rehab too, because I mean, those are the ones that are, are, are close to animals that you're either observing animals or you're, you're working on them if you work in a sanctuary. Um, but 
what I wanted you to say, asking you that question is that you can have a career that benefits conservation in many different ways, that it's a huge field. And I don't think people are thinking not creatively enough, but, um, just that they could do something else, but work for a conservation organization and have a huge impact. Like, like you said, fundraising is huge. If you're a good fundraiser and can get a lot of money for a conservation organization, that can be more important than the research sometimes because you can't do the research without money. Um, so I just think people need to think about it more broadly. And I love that, that you're talking about that. Yeah. And there's, there's lots that, yeah, yeah. There's lots that kind of sit within that. One is like, it's like, like scale of impact, like where do you want to be? Um, so as a fundraiser and as a communicator, really like your impact can be very wide and broad, but you're not really connected to it. So as a communicator, you might have a great press release that goes into hundreds of newspapers around the world. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you think, so what? I mean, what difference did I really make with that press release? Did, did it really change any opinions? Did it change any behaviors? It's very hard to connect. You know you've done good, yeah. but you don't know quite what you've done. Perhaps as a researcher or someone who's working on a site, like a warden and ranger type job, which is another one of the 15 job types um, that, we, that we talk about, um, that is much more kind of site-based, local. You often understand the site, the species. You know, you, you know that you put that owl box up when the owl flies in. You, you connected to that. You know, that was part of... You know, that's part of the impact that you've created, but at the very local level. So it's sort of understanding, you know, where do you want your impact to lie? Is it, is it something you want to kind of see, touch, feel, in which case actually being really hands-on and close to your subject and what you're doing might be important? Or do you want really big impacts? So advocacy and policy is another big area, you know. You can sort of change one word in the Paris Climate Change Accord, and that could have a huge impact across mm -hmm. the globe. So sort of where, you know, where is it you want to be? Um, another another idea kind of sparks when you sort of mentioned about the diversity and understanding job types and, and realizing there's more out there than, than people understand is that we actually have stats, which is quite interesting on on the main job types in terms of how many of those jobs typically are available just for the kind of volume of jobs that we find and that mm -hmm. we share through conservation careers. Um, but on the other side of it, we also know, you know, how many people search and, and view those jobs as well. So we can sort of see what, like abundance um, and also um, popularity. I guess those are the kind of two two ratings that we have for the different jobs. So we can see, you know, if there's a really abundant job, but they're not very popular, they're actually, they, they are, you know, in many respects, like a really good opportunity people can be looking yeah. at. And fundraising is an obvious one, actually. We do see quite a few fundraising jobs, but they're not the kind of sexy appealing jobs that people go for. So if you're a good fundraiser, you, you know, mm -hmm. you've got a really good chance of getting a job and, and actually having a really kind of fruitful career. Um, we see lots of science and research jobs, but quite a lot of people looking for them too. Yeah, right. um, and the ones that we see um, a lot of a lot of interest in and are probably most competitive is probably marine conservation. You know, people hmm. are really passionate about the, the the big blue, and so yeah, we we list a lot of those jobs, but they're the ones that get most people looking at them. So, you know, I think just understanding you know which are the hot jobs and where the opportunities might lie within the sector kind of helps people a little bit. So you would say that the the most or the least competitive field is probably fundraising. Um, so off the top of my head, I don't have the stats in front of me. Uh, fundraising's up there. So is communications. Um, yeah, as an area that, that not lots of people are really looking at in volumes yet, but mm -hmm. the, the jobs are there, and, and employers really want people working in that in that niche. Yeah. David Attenborough said recently that um, conservation in this century is, is, a, is a communications challenge. We know what mm -hmm. we need to do. You know, we now just need to convince more people to do it, essentially. You know, right. and really that is all about comms. So, you know, and, and organizations are now employing lots more comms people. And within that, you know, social media managers and so on and so forth, everything kind of sits within that. Um, just trying to think which is the which is another niche which is relatively um open um really like less competitive um what about uh, um yeah. salary like i people ask me sometimes right. like which jobs are the most lucrative and and do you think people yeah. should should go after those jobs or should they go after their passion instead well i think so yeah i mean some jobs are better paid than others 
Um, and I think the, the bottom line is it depends what's important to you right now in your mm. career, what are your current needs? You know, we all have different needs. Some of us want to be, some of us need training as our, as our preference. Some of us need flexibility because we have families or other stuff going on. Some of us just need salary because we've got debts we need to pay off or mortgages or whatever. So I think understanding, we have a process that we can lead people through for them to understand these different things. And if salary is really important for you and there is nothing wrong with that, you know, money isn't a dirty thing. We all need it to live and survive and thrive. Um, then some jobs are better paid than others. So when we think about the better paid jobs, you know, within the sector, they are things like, um, well, consultancy is probably right up there. So mm -hmm. ecological consultancy, because you're largely working for kind of corporate business, um, you know, so they tend to be better paid. So jobs within that area. If you're working for a charity, you tend to be paid less. Um, but they still dominate the sector. But within that, which are the better paid jobs, um, science and research, not bad, pretty good. And, and again, if you're within academia, it tends to be a bit better within government, can mm. be quite good. Um, also, we talked about it a few times now, but fundraising, you know, if you're a good fundraiser and you've got and your track record is strong, then you really can demand quite a salary because you know you, you you can generate a lot more than you get paid very directly very measurably um so there's lots of you know there's lots of options there salary you know is something that's important to people yeah can i ask your take on this might be a controversial question but um, so i know it's a hot topic right now where there's so many non-paying internships and volunteer experiences. And for some of them, you even have to pay. And that excludes a lot of people. And mm -hmm. um, a lot of students are arguing that we should do away with those. But as a scientist being on the other side, um, I had all this research to do and I had students contact me being like, can I volunteer and help you with your research? And I tried to get money. I, I, I um, wrote a lot of grants to try to fund students, but none of them came through. So I had a hard time declining them and I didn't, I, ex I accepted them and, um, and, you know, like they, I let them be on my publications and stuff. I, and they get a valuable experience out of that. Mm. But um, as I mentioned before, it's only, it can only be for the privileged if other people need to, to work, to pay for college. So what, what are your, uh, what's your take on that? Or do you have any ideas for like how to solve this problem? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's, um, it's a big area and it's worth, it's worth discussing, mm -hmm. I think as well in detail. I think, um, I think there's a few bits around that. Firstly, I think the word kind of internship and, and volunteer is used to describe a whole array, a, a quite a wide array of different mm -hmm. experiences that people might be having, some of which are exploitative, you know, and, and they shouldn't be doing it and it's not of a quality and maybe they should just be paid as well. It should be staff. Um, whereas some of it, you know, might be even, you know, actual quality training, you know, of, of a level that, you know, it's worth paying for. If you went to university, you did a master's degree or something like that. I think people don't tend to worry about the fact that you're paying for to receive some quality training as a result. And some things are labeled, you know, internship, whereas actually, if you just called it training, which is what it is, you're getting really good hands on training. And actually, mm -hmm. I don't think I don't have any any problem with actually, you know, charging you know people to do that. I think that's OK. The problem comes when it's kind of more the kind of the exploited end of the spectrum where you're doing work for free and you're not getting a good experience out and the balance is all wrong. You know, you, you, you should be, you know, if you're volunteering your time into something, then you should be getting more back in return for that. So so understanding where that balance comes from. Um, at a personal level is really important to you is sort of unpaid internships and volunteers all bad um, no I mean interesting I mean here in the UK our biggest conservation organization is the RSPB it's the Royal Society for the Protection of mm -hmm. Birds they have over a million members here in the UK and we're an island nation of about 60 million people so we really care about birds there's a, there's a lot of people signed up to that organization they have about I think I'm writing saying about sort of 3,000 staff um, but I would guess they have something of the order of 50,000 volunteers that help them yeah. at their sites, at their reserves, doing hands-on stuff in the evenings, weekends, you know, going out, managing the site, that sort of stuff. And a lot of people do it because they really want to do it and they love doing it, you know, and it certainly helps conservation efforts. Without that volunteer army, they just wouldn't get even a fraction of the work done and they wouldn't help the fraction of the bird species that they are. So, you know, right. they just, and, and, and they simply couldn't pay. They just simply mm -hmm. couldn't pay those people as much as, as they may want to. So then that's the truth of it. Um, 
but within that there are you know there are lots of people who are doing it because they want experience and they want to kind of test drive the the, the roles you know understand whether it's right for them to get good stuff that goes onto their cvs and get out into the field and enjoy it and network with you know the, the 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 staff members there that are kind of leading those volunteer days and 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 experiences like that so i think there's lots of of benefits of doing it and and you should get more out of that, out of it than than you put in but i think um but yeah but i you know i think the, there's another bit to this as well that it's worth talking about which is like you know um there are a lot of internships out there i mean there's three there's three types of internships there's one you pay for there's ones that, you know, have no cost associated with them. And there are some where you get paid. You know, there are some out there. And we have a list on our site that kind of lists. The kind mine of actually were paid. I had uh, all of mine were paid except for well, my Kenya one. I was paid in a Kenya salary. So that was a lot less. And I did have to pay for half of my airfare. So it ended up being like right. free for and I was I was fed and housed and stuff. So it ended up, up just being like I didn't make money for a year. But um, but yeah, both of mine in the United States were, were paid. Good. Yeah. And that's, I'm, I'm, we all want to see more of that. You know, that, that's, mm-hmm. that's, that's great. That's kind of, you know, how it should be. Um, so there's the paid ones, there's the kind of the no cost ones and the ones you pay for. If you're going to pay for it, you really want to make sure you're going somewhere that's really good quality. You're going to get really good quality experience and training, you know, so really ask questions, do your research, make sure, you know, you're doing it for the right reasons and understand, you know, the, you choose those internships based upon what you actually need for your career right now you know up, up on the gap so if you're going for a specific job type you know and they're looking for certain things and there's something you need to get experience of then maybe internships is one way of doing that be really focused and t- strategic find the ones that are just right for you and really deliver that thing and make you more employable as a result um and the paid ones recognize they're out there so we've got a list um but you know they are going to be competitive with two, so don't don't not go for them. But just realize that they're going yeah. to be the competitive ones. Obviously, people are getting a salary, so that's great. But the middle ground, the unpaid ones, you know that that I think is the real fruitful area to be looking if you want quality experience. Because I get that those the ones you pay for is a very much biased towards those people who have deep pockets or, you know, wealthy parents or whatever mm-hmm. it might be. You know that that's 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 not great. You know for this planet, you know we, we want to kind of level things up a bit more than that. But there's a lot of people in the middle ground whereby, you know, experiences, they're just not advertised. They've not even been conceptualized yet by people. So, you know, there's lots of organizations out there that have lots of busy staff, you know, conservation is a busy people, you know, and a lot of them would value a really good person coming in and helping them that they could train and give experience to. Um, and in return, that person would receive, you know, a great career boost as a result that could go to their CV and help them to network and so on and so forth. But because those conservation staff members are so busy, they're often not sitting down writing kind of job descriptions for interns, right. advertising, shortlisting, interviewing, choosing the right person, training them up. They just don't have time for all that sort of stuff. So what we encourage people to do is to actually um, create your own internship, you know, through your own endeavors and through networking. So LinkedIn's a great place to be doing this. You know, jump into LinkedIn, understand the sort of role you want to be doing. That's always the foundation. Find your niche. Um, from there, let's say you want to be a communications officer for instance you know find communications officers doing working for organizations that are quite closely aligned to what you want to do or find people doing really good work in the area ask yourself who's great at communications in conservation where would i get the best internship experience you might think wwf or someone like that you know that are really a green piece you know someone's really outward facing really professional you're gonna there'll be a big team of people who know what they're doing you know the best best of the best type stuff you know, and then jump onto LinkedIn, find who is the communications manager, communications director in WWF, local to you, whoever that might be, find that name and then connect with them. You know, we, we, we teach people, you know, how do you write an email to people out of the blue, a cold email? Mm-hmm. You're not writing saying, you know, my name's Nick Askew, I'd like an internship, any available. <laughs> you know, it's, it's how do you start to build a relationship? How do you connect to someone? And then how do you sort of work towards an internship? That, that is a much better approach to take, you know, and it needs to be really personal. It's really bespoke. You need to find that person. You need to understand what they're doing, what you can offer, how you can help them and kind of, you know, build that connection. And that can often lead to really good, best quality internships, you know, that don't cost you money, but really give you a lot back in return. I love that um, because I think so many students, they just like wait around and they only go for what's applied. And I think that's how a lot of them happen. So I love that advice. That's such great advice. 
I had a student, um, I get asked to be interviewed a lot for projects. I guess they're like college projects. <laughs> they want you to interview somebody. And like one was just like, Hey, is it okay if I interview you? <laughs> like, this is not how you, and they were interested in my career. And I was like, this is I not see. how you start networking with somebody. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I just wanted to add, <laughs> I said I was too busy. Actually, I, I usually do decline those interviews just because I don't have the time to keep doing those one-on-one interviews. Um, in the beginning I did do a couple, but I just, I just don't have the time yeah, right now. Yeah. And if they're interested in wildlife biology careers, then I direct them to like resources that can help them. But sure. mo- yeah, it's mostly to get them familiar with the career. But I just yeah. wanted to add that I talked to uh, Jeffrey Hunter the, the other day from the National Parks Conservation Association, and he worked in, in corporate um, in Verizon for 20 years. And during those 20 years, he volunteered at um, various um, nonprofits and natural history organizations. And um he switched, he got an environmental sciences degree while at Verizon still, um, they paid for it. Um, and he got a job pretty easily afterwards. I was actually, it was a second interview Mm -hmm. and I was really shocked at that. And he thinks one of the reasons why is because he had so much experience doing this volunteer work that they considered it to be, um, you know, real work to be professional experience. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to add that. So people out there know that just because you're not getting paid doesn't mean it's not valuable and, and, um, yeah, something really that you can add to your resume. Yeah. It's, it can set you apart and really evidence your passion. It's very easy in an application to say, I'm really passionate about for me, barn owls, whatever it might be. <laughs> so what, tell me what you've done to help barn owls, yeah. you know, and if the, if it stops there, then it's quite shallow. Whereas if you, you know, if you can actually say I've done this volunteer work, you know, it's proven that I love it. You know, I enjoyed it. I mean, you should enjoy the volunteering you're doing as well. That's the bottom line. Yeah. If, it's, if it's working towards this career you want, then it should be fun, hopefully. And if it isn't, then listen to yourself. You know, what's that telling you about this thing you're doing? Maybe it's not quite right. You know, maybe there's something else off to one side you need to explore. Um, but yeah, we, but when you're looking to kind of become competitive too, I think within, you know, a competitive environment like conservation, then, you know, there are graduates coming out of university who have, you know, solid bachelors and solid degrees and masters and whatever. And one way to set yourself aside and apart from those people is, is have, in addition, you know, the, the experience you got alongside just is that volunteer or internship mm-hmm. you did in the weekends or in your vacations. Same if you're a career switcher, you know, yet you've been working for, you know, Virgin Media in the marketing team, but why do you not work in conservation now? You know, this seems a bit weird. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, if you can show you've been doing all this stuff alongside your job and your career, then it kind of makes sense. The story kind of comes together much more clearly as well. So I think, yeah, your friend from Bryson, you know, that mm-hmm. absolutely resonates with that. So I said one more question for you. What do you think is bad advice that is still being perpetuated for people who want to go into this career? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a great question. Bad advice. Um, <laughs> I stumped you. Yeah. I've never been asked that before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I, I think any advice that doesn't, I mean, I, I, we try to be as evidence-based as we can be at conservation careers. And I say, we're not looking to glorify the sector. Um, we're looking to make it more honest, open, and transparent. So these are the job types. This is what it's like to do those jobs. This is what employers are looking for. This is day-to-day warts and all stuff. You're pushing mm-hmm. emails around, you know, it's, you know, this is, this is the reality of it. So I, I think bad advice that, that, um, doesn't Maybe you have... talk to really helpful people that you're only getting good advice from them. You're well, yeah. so I think, <laughs> You've been I think... doing this for so long. You're out of the bubble where there's bad advice. Yeah. So what doesn't work? So anything that's just kind of just an opinion, but hasn't got evidence behind that, I think we need to be cautious of. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like individual experiences and individual opinions are, you know, of, of some merit, but I think you really need to look at recurring patterns and repeating patterns that have shown success. I think that's that's really important. I think things to avoid, which is not the same answering the same question, but mm. <laughs> things to avoid are things like um, well, I think I think spreading yourself too thin is a real problem in the sector. Yeah. So going for you know lots and lots of different job types and not really having a, a, a focus and a target um, makes you less competitive and gives you less chance of being successful. 
Um, I think reusing your resume many times for lots of different job types and not really working hard to, to tailor it and make it very specific to each job in question. I mean, you don't mm-hmm. need to write it from bare bones, but you really need to understand it from the recruiter's perspective that they, they have these set criteria they're looking for. Your application clearly needs to articulate why you, why you meet what they're looking for. And, and a generic resume and a generic cover letter can't do that. You really need yeah. to, we call it tailor it, you know, bespoke it. You know, that's really important. Um, yeah. And then there's, there's, I guess there's, there's lots more that kind of go alongside that. But I think, I think those are problems. And, and talking about, you know, the, the non-specialist approach, like being a generalist and why that's an issue, if it's helpful. I think I always think of like working and securing your first paying conservation job, which is always going to be the hardest one. It's the hardest first step. Once you've got a job, yeah. you, you know, the ball's rolling. You're being paid. You're getting experience. You know, the second job's going to be easier. You can have to choose when you move and everything gets better from there. And but that first job's hardest. That's the most competitive one. It's a bit like, I think, like going to the Olympics and trying to secure a gold medal. You know, so if you're going to hopefully this year, the Tokyo Olympics, and, you know, there's different approaches to securing medals at an event like that. One is you can say, I'm going to go for every event. There's 50 different events out there. <laughs> if I enter all 50, I've got myself yeah. 50 chances of a gold medal, right? You know, and it's the same with your job point. If you just go for every job that looks interesting, you're spreading yourself too thin. You're always going to be up against someone who's specialized and doubled down and got really good for that event. They chose it because they're right for it. It's the yeah. Michael Phelps of the world with the wingspan and the big feet. And, you know, he's born for swimming and then he trained really hard for swimming. You're, you're not going to jump in a pool and beat him. And it's, it's, it's the same in the job and a little bit, you know, f- understand yourself, understand what you're bringing to the party. What do you love doing? What are you great at doing? Do you like being outside or inside in groups on your own? There's all sorts of different ways of analyzing yourself Mm -hmm. um, and understanding where you're going to thrive. And then from that, understand the career sector, the different jobs, employer types that are out there. Bring it all together. Find your sweet spot. Find your niche. Find your event, if you like. And then from there, you know, double down. Become good at it. You know, get experience of doing it. Fill any gaps that, that you identify that employees are looking for that you don't currently have. You know, and make sure you you put in really good quality applications, prepare for, deliver great interviews. And that's that's the process that we teach, you know. And um, and I, and I think once you've found your niche and found your sweet spot, everything else falls into place. That's the hard bit. That's that yeah, really the I, hard bit. But- I totally agree with you. And that was my experience too, is that even when I applied for jobs that I was really qualified for, there was still like somebody else with just more experience or an additional skill that I didn't have, but I, I lied. I want to ask you actually one more question. <laughs> one more quick <laughs> question. I know we're running out of time. Um, but I see on these, like this, I'm not sure if you're part of these Facebook groups, like the wildlife workers network mm, and stuff yep. like that. I see a lot of times people say that they're applying for like hundreds of jobs and not getting anything. Now, in my mm-hmm. opinion, if you're applying for hundreds of jobs and not getting anything, you're doing something wrong because there's yep. either something wrong with your cover letter or your CV. And you would agree with that. Hundred percent. Can you, can you, is there any sort of like rate that you could gauge? Like, should you be getting an interview for like one out of 10 jobs or like, how can, how can you like, you know, kind of know that yeah. you're doing okay? Yeah, I get, yes. I can't give an exact figure, but exactly. We, we hear that too, you know, I've put in hundreds of applications and I've yeah. not had any interviews. Well, there's something wrong there. Either right. you're not, you're not ready for that mm-hmm. job. You know, there's something missing on your CV. You're spreading yourself too thin, like we just talked about. You're going for all the gold medals rather than trying to, mm-hmm. uh, rather than focusing on your niche. Um, and I, w- I, by the way, I wouldn't, I wouldn't blink yourself saying I found my niche. I don't look at anything else. I'd still encourage you to follow your heart. If a yeah. good, if a good job pops up and it's really attractive, and you think you've got a good chance for it, please go for it. You know, you never know what's going to happen. Keep your op- opportunities open, but have that direction, have that niche. That's really important. Or quite often actually you know people are just putting in applications that suck they just they're just uh, you know they're just they're they're just not following a process that helps um a recruiter to shortlist them and invite them to interview Mm -hmm. and that might be because they're reusing their resume again and again you know um making silly errors formatting spelling whatever it might be you know um, or they just don't understand the, the skill and process and art actually of, of producing an application that really stands out from the bunch and just shows the evidence that you can do this job to the standard that that, that application that, that the recruiter is looking for. So there's somewhere yeah. in there you're either not ready, you know, you're unfocused, or your applications aren't good enough, or or 
a bit of everything, but certainly, you know, if you're putting in high volumes of applications, also, if you're putting in high volumes of applications, you're probably not spending much time on each application. Right. So like just firing them out, like, you know. That's what I think the big problem of an Uzi. is. Yeah. That's what I suspect it is. Well, uh, thank you so much. Oh, sorry. Did you have something else? I was else just going to say think? quality over quantity is, is key. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, I agree. I once I Once I found out that I wasn't getting jobs that like, like I was being a generalist and just applying for jobs. Cause that was the bad advice I was given in graduate school that I would qualify for these different jobs. But once I found that out not to be true, I was very choosy about the jobs I applied for. And I put a lot of work into those applications and you're Absolutely. right. I had to write definitely cover letters. Like I could reuse maybe a paragraph or a couple of sentences, but honestly I had to pretty much rewrite everyone. Yeah. Yeah, that's it, which is no fun for anyone. No one enjoys doing that, but yeah. it, it's, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here and I wish you good luck with your business. I hope it does become a huge, gigantic business that can raise tons of money for conservation thank you, <laughs> and, help thank out, you. and help out tons of people. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's really nice to connect with you too, Stephanie. Thanks yeah. for reaching out. It's great to bring your podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Wow, that was such a great interview. But before I go, I want to talk about a couple of takeaways, a couple of key things that I got from this interview that I want to make sure that stick with you, the main key points. Um, so you can find Nick and Conservation Careers at conservation-careers.com. Their social media is at Conservation Careers on Instagram and at Conserve Careers without the, without the E in Conserve on Twitter. They also have a Conservation Careers podcast that gives away great conservation career advice. <laughs> seeing conservation careers a lot, uh, when they interview different guests. And I'm actually a guest um, that's coming up on their podcast, so I'm so excited. They have job boards. They have advice. I'm actually going to integrate their job board into my website, so you can go to fancyscientist.com to get there. Um, so hopefully that will be up by the time this episode comes out. Okay, so the takeaways. One of, or probably the main, the biggest takeaway is, um, like Nick said, make sure you figure out your, your niche. That's exactly what happened to me is that I thought I was um, going to have this experience and then it would translate into a bunch of different things. I thought getting a PhD was a blanket certification and that I could get a job with a consulting agency, I could get a job with the Nature Conservancy, that I wouldn't have any problems. But no, I did not find that to be the case at all. The jobs that I was most competitive for were those that I matched the qualifications for almost perfectly. And even then, I still had a lot of competition. I didn't get those jobs. Um, if you read my book, I go into detail about my background, the, all of the jobs that I applied for. I present all the jobs I got interviews for and the ones that I didn't get interviewed for. I actually had a pretty high success rate of getting interviews. I would say, I wanna say maybe 25%. So um, like we talked about at the end, if you're applying for hundreds of jobs and you're not getting anything, something's wrong. You want to stop. You want to analyze your situation, what's going on. So to figure out your niche, I have a course, um, Confusion to Clarity, that helps you immensely. I don't think it's going to be out when I um, when this podcast airs. So you can go to fancyscientist.com and get on my email list, and then you will be alerted when the course comes out. I'm planning to do it live again, I think in July. So I only think I'm going to do it twice a year. Um, so that is a great way. Also, I recommend you go to fancyscientist.com and get the job tracker. This tool is immensely helpful for people. I've gotten feedback from a PhD student who used it, and she said she's going to use it for um, like years down the line. But what it is, is it's a way to organize your jobs. So, you, But you should use it now because even if you're not looking for jobs now, what you should be doing is looking at the end result now. So you're gonna download the job, job tracker and it's really a spreadsheet. And whenever you find jobs, you're gonna copy and paste the information into the spreadsheet. And by doing that, it really slows you down and forces you to think about what that job does. So you have a great understanding of the skills needed. So if you are, um, 
like like how I was, I applied for an executive director position at a nonprofit, and I got um, an interview for it. I was a, I was a strong candidate, but I didn't have fundraising skills. So if I was interested in nonprofit jobs at all, and I did this job tracker, I would have noticed that fundraising was huge. So during my PhD, I should have gotten some fundraising skills, and then maybe I would have gotten the job. So start the job tracker now. If you're young, that is better. The other takeaway I wanted to mention is about a cold emailing people using LinkedIn. Get on LinkedIn. You need an internet presence. I have a blog post that says you need a bio. So great if you have your own website, I tell you how to set that up, but you at the very least need to be found on the internet and need a LinkedIn um, presence, um, a bio. And so LinkedIn has not helped me find any jobs. Like I haven't found jobs on LinkedIn, but it helps you connect with people. So anytime I meet anyone professionally, I add them to my LinkedIn network. So it's it's like a, a reservoir that I can go to um, for remembering people. But the great thing about LinkedIn is that you can see who's connected to each other. So if I um, am, I want to work with somebody and I know my boss knows them then um, or my former boss then that is a great way that I can get in I can ask him to introduce us or I can do a cold email to that person and say that I've worked with um, my former boss and um, that will likely be a, a good in and they're more likely to pay attention to the email so don't be afraid to contact people um, on the one podcast I had um, a student at Confusion to Clarity class, Hannah, and she reached out to somebody at the museum, the curator of herpetology in the North Carolina Museum, and she didn't even ask him for anything specific, but he invited her to look at the collections. This led to an internship, so don't be afraid to cold email. So I asked, I asked, um, Nick a question, what's some bad advice that is still out there? So I'm gonna go ahead and answer this. I think the, the bad advice that I was thinking of particular was just simply taking the next step. So like if you're in a bachelor's program or I, I see this a lot on the job boards too on the, or on the Facebook group posts where they can't find a job. So they're like, okay, should I get my master's? And then once you get your master's, people encourage you to get your PhD and you just follow this like step by step by step thing. And I never really paused along the way to think about what I wanted my final outcome to be. That's again where the job tracker comes in because you might not need to get a PhD. Don't get a PhD just to get a PhD. You get these degrees to get jobs. So if you want a job that doesn't require that, then don't get that. And in academia, it's it's very closed. They just, like I said, it's just like the step-by-step -step, step process. And so often, I see this so often, students focus on just the degrees only. They're like, what degree I should get? What, what courses I should get? When, like Nick said, it's really about your experience. So thank you guys so much for listening. If you're on YouTube, thank you so much for, for watching. And I hope you have a great day.